and a cultural awareness. My good colleague Katarina Bojovic is also here today. She is the head of knowledge ecology at Diplo, a researcher and a lecturer in e-diplomacy and internet governance courses. Uh, she will present data trends from Diplo Academy's alumni from a gender perspective, and she has kindly agreed to be our remote moderator today. And without further ado, I would like to uh, start with my first question. Well, all of you come from different uh, backgrounds, different experiences. So initially, I'd like a very brief introduction of your uh, respective fields and then and then your experiences, um, well, as a female diplomat, ambassador, attache, whatever your position uh, may be, and your perceived advantages or disadvantages so far, and if there is or there has been a gender gap in your fields. So um, but right now I'm seeing Juicy right in front of me. Would you like to go first, Juicy? Yes. And Hi. Just before you start, I'm very sorry uh, for to all our panelists, to all our speakers. Uh, please try to uh, limit your answers to five minutes because I want uh, everyone to yeah. benefit from your experiences. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Good, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm, uh, um, as, as you just said, I'm uh, the science counselor for health at the Embassy of Italy in, in Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm a medical doctor as a training. Uh, but first of all, and right now, I'm a science diplomat. And more than this, I'm a woman in science diplomacy. So science diplomacy, uh, is the, the term itself involves a wide uh, range of activities connecting science and technology with international affairs. So it is a tool uh, used as a power to advance uh, diplomatic objectives. And uh, it is a passport. It is a common language. It is an open challenge of of communication. So most of the challenges, the pandemic, climate change, biodiversity, pollution, need a scientific dimension to both understand and address them. Uh, these challenges uh, cross the borders. So no country will be able to, to solve them alone. So we need uh, inclusion. So we need the women because we need diversity. And uh, science, uh, uh, women in science and diplomacy uh, reflect the, the trend of women in diplomacy and the trend of women in science. Um, so it's very interesting that more or less we talk about numbers and the numbers are almost the same. We talk about 22, 23, 24 percent of female present in, in, in science and diplomacy which is more or less the same in diplomacy and the same in, uh, in, in science. So we, uh, uh, I mean, we, we have a time to, to discuss about the reasons, but from my point of view, we have uh, uh, two main uh, points to, to, to dive in. Uh, from one end, we have uh, um, uh, a, a policy problem. So we miss policies focus on gender equality in science diplomacy, in science and in diplomacy. Uh, so we should talk more with um, uh, policymakers, with the government, with the institution to develop new policies focused on gender equality. And we will have time to, 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 to explore every single option. From the other hand, we need to raise awareness because it's not enough. And science diplomacy, by the way, more than diplomacy, more than science, uh, is a recent field. So probably there is not enough, uh, not enough awareness. So we should work on communication. We should work on uh, uh, networking. We should work on mentoring. So we, we have a lot of things to discuss. I don't want to uh, just <laughs> anticipate everything. So uh, thank you. Thank you. And I mean, let's continue after with the other speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Juicy, for that uh, great brief uh, introduction to the question. And yeah, a bit later, like the percentages you gave, uh, that they're more or less uh, true uh, around the world. Of course, it changes from region to region, but approximately uh, from the 2020s up until now, the percentage of female uh, ambassadors and diplomats in the field are around 20%, which is nowhere near uh, equal or close since uh, women make up half the world's population. So uh, next, I would like to go to, okay, my list here is like, it's 
so mixed up. Uh, Ambassador Maud, uh, would you please briefly introduce uh, yourself and your take on your field? And you, you're also a veteran in the area. So like, and if you have observed any changes uh, in the last decades, that would also be valuable. But I would, we would just like love to hear uh, your general take on the gender gap in diplomacy and your personal experience around it. Uh, good afternoon and to everybody who's here. And thank you so much uh, for inviting us uh, to this very important discussion. Um, I think we've come up a lot uh, more better. There's a lot of work which still needs to be done, uh, but there's still, uh, th th there are some uh, achievements somewhere. Let me, let me explain that. I come from the, uh, I grew up in the labor movement and the labor movement, trade union movement, it was at the time, uh, male dominated. And uh, usually when people came up with gender issues, they'll be at the end of the agenda. Uh, at that time, everybody's exhausted and, and we, we hardly uh, got into the end of the program. And I was a teenager then. And then some years later, we were able to um, start a sexual harassment education project with one of the professors in one of our universities. And we went back to the trade union movement, the federation and start teaching about what is sexual harassment at the, uh, the workplace. And we were able at that time to influence in such a way that our labor relations uh, act, the, the, the law for the country was able to put in an addendum which clearly describes what sexual harassment is and how it should be dealt with at the workplace. And then I came to uh, foreign ministry, I will jump because uh, <laughs> at a certain time you've got many places and sectors where you've been, but, um, uh, the issues of gender equality has always been part of my life and part of my education. Um, and when I came to uh, the, for our foreign ministry, and then I was responsible for training. And, and in South Africa, it was after the, uh, the democracy and freedom. So we had to relook at how we were uh, teaching our diplomats and how they should represent a new South Africa, a more equal South Africa. And it was during then that we started a program on peace and security. Uh, and we meant to, to have this program for everyone, uh, our alliances in the world, particularly in the African continent, uh, about peace and security and conflict resolution skills and, and um, using our experience as South Africa. And in one of the programs, women who were there from some of the countries in, in Africa said to us, we just need a, a program for women only. Uh, because in these meetings, uh, men talk too much because they've got lots of experience, but we've got a different experience and we never get an opportunity to, to, to share uh, what we think and what we've experienced. So we started a program uh, on, on training uh, women as mediators and, um, and negotiators, as, as peacemakers, basically. And they also said they would like a mentoring program and we started um, an annual conference. And, and since then, I must say, because we're working with different partners with no way um, the, the, there have been a lot of movement in terms of women in peace and security and has influenced a lot, even foreign ministers coming uh, together uh, to say we need a feminist policy. Um, we need a different approach in, in the way we deal with diplomacy, uh, which is inclusive. Um, there is a, there, I can say that in terms of policy, when it comes to that, it has been agreed because we, we felt then Women mediators and negotiators are never involved uh, in these programs where uh, peacemaking is being done. Perhaps it's because they are not trained enough. Then we started training them 10 years ago. We've got 850 women who have been trained in the continent. Nobody's using them. So the policy is there, but it's not applied. And the institution and the, the, the instruments for making sure that women, you've got a a roster in a database which is inclusive and which is transparent and which is fair and which is going to use the women which are available. Uh, it's, it's fair but not used the way it should be. And so our, uh, our fight as we go forward in working with the different networks, the global networks for women in peace and security and other networks in the continent and elsewhere, we are saying we need to fight to make sure that the women who are capable are able to, to, to be included in these uh, programs where they bring priest, uh, being peace um, and justice to the world. Um, so sometimes they, 
there is no uh, policy, but sometimes there is policy in that people are just moving on it and not moving the way they should uh, going forward. So there's still a lot of work. And I just want to say, when you think about what happened about two years ago, the Me Too movement, which was led by celebrities in the world in terms of sexual harassment. Uh, I that's that not. I'm very sorry to uh, interrupt, but before we get into the Me Too movement, yes, uh, yes. If I, I may... just say that we've moved a long way and there have been some achievements. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you touched on an extra important point where, yeah, sometimes the, there aren't any women trained in specific areas, but like you said, there was a training program. Now there are trained women, uh, hundreds of them, but they're not being appointed. So this is obviously a multi-layered uh, issue that that can't be easily solved with just um, training our women, but we'll uh, go much deeper into that. So uh, thank you for that introduction. That was um, amazing. So next up, uh, our special envoy, uh, Tatiana Iosper. Would you also like to make an intro to this uh, very important, difficult, complex, yet uh, great issue? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diplo Foundation, for uh, marking the International uh, Women in Diplomacy Day. It's it's a new, uh, newly established uh, day, and we are very happy to see that is it's being celebrated around the world. My ministry did a. Uh, um, uh, a special communication on, on this occasion uh, because uh, we just had a, a new foreign minister appointed and she, she's a lady and uh, we are very proud of that. Uh, going back to your uh, question of the panel, uh, are we there yet? Uh, I don't think we're there yet, but I think we have come a long way. Uh, just uh, to, to give my personal example, when I joined the foreign ministry, uh, 30 years ago, there were just a handful of women diplomats. And right now, 30 years later, um, more than half of the women diplomats in, in, in Romania are, uh, are uh, of the diplomats in Romania are women. 47% uh, of the managerial positions are women and about 35% uh, are uh, of the our ambassadors are, uh, are women. Um, the um, uh, hold on a second. I have a, a, an issue with my with my video. Uh, the um, uh, oh, but while, while you sort it out really quickly, like is it is it okay? Is everything fine? I yeah. I think she's also writing. So, but I I I have to say that those numbers are very impressive and I did not know them about Romania. So thank you for sharing them and I'll leave you the floor. Tatiana, we can't hear you. Tatiana, can you hear us? I think not. I think she can't hear us and we can't hear her. I'm very sure we're missing a lot of interesting facts right now. But maybe if we, if can we unmute her again, Tire or Arvin, to see if her audio will be back? Tatiana, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Still. Okay. How about to save time? I will get back. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Now, now we can. Okay, you're back. <laughs> sorry, sorry for that. Again, some some communication issue. I'm not sure what what you got from what I said. I was just saying that um, uh, in what I do right now as a special envoy for energy, there are not uh, not many many women in that position. It's still a male dominated field, as probably in in security and as we've heard from our colleague from Italy in in uh, science and uh, and. Technology. Yes, we, we've heard the last bit and we, uh, the, the part between uh, how Romania had uh, more than 40 percent uh, women in senior positions, that part. But then after that, the mid part was oh, missing. I'm sorry. Yes, we have 35 uh, percent of our ambassadors are women. And I think this is this is a great accomplishment because women in the foreign service were allowed only uh, after the, the 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 change of regime in Romania, so about 30, 32 years ago. Wow. Okay, this is very impressive, and we're gonna we're going to get back to you again. So uh, thank you for that, Tatiana.
Sonia, sorry if I may jump in, you are muted. Sonia, please unmute. Okay, I think as apologies for that. Oh, sorry. Okay, I was too focused on Tatiana's audio that I forgot to take care of my own. Um, I was saying I would love to give the floor uh, next to Ambassador Maria Calieri. Uh, we've been talking about, in, about Africa and in uh, South Africa and Romania and Italy, and she has worked in Libya and now is based in the United Arab Emirates. So, uh, on top of your general take, I would also like to hear if you observed any regional differences because of some research, I feel like uh, the, the Middle East, I'm also based in Turkey, in Istanbul, and in the Middle East, uh, when it comes to gender equality, the, some percentages go even lower. So uh, what's, what is your take on the gender gap in overall diplomacy and foreign policy and uh, also from your regional uh, experience? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting um, us and me um, to this event. Um, uh, as a as a as a woman who has been working in this field for twenty four years now, um, I feel honored that we have a day. Um, I don't know whether I need to be happy or sad that it has come so late. Um, uh, but at least we have a day where we can honor women in diplomacy and women um, who have dedicated their lives to diplomacy as well. Um, my experience um, uh, is, is, is quite interesting. The first day I joined the foreign ministry, um, I was posted in a particular department and immediately I was presented to um, my director. His reaction was, what will I do with a woman? Um, uh, so it was quite shocking. You can imagine for a 24-year-old um, uh, to be faced with this big man saying, what do I do with a woman? Um, uh, on my very first day um, uh, in my diplomatic experience. Um, uh, I, I, I think one of the... Um, one of the elements that helped me was perseverance. I'm a bit hard headed. And uh, after two years, when I needed to move to a new department to get a new experience, his reaction to his own superior was, why are you taking her away? Um, uh, unfortunately, um, uh, it is a proven, it, it is a, 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 a proven premise that a woman has to prove herself. Um, uh, unfortunately, it's not the same for a man. Um, uh, so, so it's uh, it's it's uh, we have to. It seems like we have to work a little bit harder when it comes to all spheres of life. But women tend to get there and tend to be, I find, um, slightly, slightly, slightly more dedicated. Um, also because um, uh, I feel that women are a bit more sedentary um, due to family um, and also due to the fact that for a very, very long time, women, unlike me now, um, have not been the breadwinners of the family. So uh, whereas men tend to look for um, higher paying, uh, always higher paying jobs, uh, women tend to focus on, uh, on more vocational um, aspects of their job. Um, the gender gap in my field when it comes to diplomacy, now pure diplomacy, not, 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 not any particular field within diplomacy, when it comes to the pure diplomacy, I think the gender gap is still there. According to a recent study, it is uh, women in diplomacy are less than 21% worldwide. And I'm sure that uh, thanks to our uh, Nordic European neighbors, we are keeping afloat at 20%. Um, uh, but we need to definitely work harder. And when I say harder, I don't mean developing countries, but also developed countries um, such as Mediterranean countries and also 
other countries in the West as well. So uh, we need to um, shatter the illusion that this is an issue that mars developing countries because there are also countries that fall under the OECD DAC criteria definition of developed, which are still way away from at least 40%, you know. Um, uh, perceived challenges and opportunities. When I came here, because, um, uh, you know, I always find people who put color in my nightmares, you know, um, uh, the... <laughs> When I was coming here, this was my this is my first ambassadorship. Um, I met someone, a high professional, um, who asked me, "But are you going to be able to work in in the Gulf region?" I said, "Why not? I mean, if I can't work, I'll come back. But if I, you know, if I can help it, I will definitely stay and stay even more." Um, uh, so. To tell you the truth, a woman can work even more effectively in this region. First of all, there are areas where women and men are segregated. And as an ambassador, I find myself on both sides of the fence. A, a male ambassador would not be able to enter into a female majlis, um, uh, a female uh, dominated ambassador. area, you know. Yes. And uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I want to hear more details about about the uh, the regional differences and even the first few sentences. It's. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't see how it would be an advantage, but now I, I kind of start to understand and but to be time sensitive. Now I want to go to our youngest female diplomat. And it was also nice to hear that you also started at a very young age at 24 and Delay. Uh, she's based in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, she works at the Belgium uh, embassy there. And as our youngest panelist, Delay, uh, please have the floor and talk about your experiences. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So uh, my name is Dilay. I'm 26 and I'm currently posted at the Belgian Embassy in Kinshasa, where I work work uh, on development cooperation, uh, specifically on education, uh, gender equality, youth and uh, cultural awareness. Um, so for the question of this, um, of this, uh, of this event, uh, are we there yet? Unfortunately not. Uh, this is, uh, this is the, the saddest uh, truth. Um, but in Belgium, uh, if I may take the example of my country, uh, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very sensitive uh, to these issues and uh, does a lot to break uh, these stereotypes and, and engage especially outreach. Uh, gender equality uh, is a priority for Belgium's domestic and uh, foreign uh, policy. And we have a very, inside our ministry, uh, active uh, and I would say proactive communication department who encourages the diplomats uh, through, throughout the year to highlight um, those priorities, but also our action and to highlight uh, the women uh, diplomats in our ministry. And our management committee approved uh, an internal gender equality action plan, uh, and it aimed to uh, promoting equal opportunities uh, and a more balanced representation of uh, women and men inside our ministry. And so the plan focuses on three main uh, areas, uh, communication and awareness, training and career support, um, and uh, ID and best practices ex exchanges. Uh, so th the goal is to work towards gen gender equality in all areas. Uh, so it means recruitment, uh, career development, uh, and appointments, and uh, combating uh, discrimination. So our ministry is very engaged in that and uh, tries to uh, daily um, go on and have more also women in diplomacy because uh, from my experience, so I joined the ministry almost uh, two years ago. And so I started at 24, which is a very, very young age. And uh, unfortunately I have already faced um, a few challenges, but I think it's important to uh, emphasize that the challenges begin even before entering into the diplomatic career. Um, so personally, I have always uh, wanted to be a diplomat and 
when I was talking about this with people, they were all questioning my career choice, saying that it was not suitable for women. Uh, it's difficult if you have a family or it's uh, unstable. So, uh, and even after passing uh, the Belgian diplomatic exam, uh, people's initial reaction was first, of course, uh, congratulations. But then it was directly, how will you manage your personal life? Uh, it's going to be difficult for a man to follow you and 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 accept your 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 career. And it's and they don't say that to men. So this is the the first challenge. Um, and another challenge that I have uh, unfortunately unfortunately faced several times, especially as a young um, woman with uh, our origins, uh, because I have Turkish roots. Uh, some people do not take you seriously. And uh, so I want to clarify, it's not uh, in my ministry, it's not uh, within the embassy colleagues, but I mean outside. Uh, and especially, I mean, in Kinshasa, which is my first posting and is a hardship, uh, considered as a hardship posting. Um, because I meet a lot of people at meetings, events, and I can immediately notice uh, a change in their attitude from certain people who initially assume that I'm someone's secretary or someone, uh, someone's partner. And when I reveal my position, uh, there's often a sense of uh, discomfort. And I believe that this is not normal. Um, women diplomats, especially young ones with diverse backgrounds should not be treated that way. And I mean, it's also important to emphasize that young women also deserve to have their place in, in, the, in diplomacy because I, I talk with a lot of students who are asking me, yeah, but is it maybe too early? Am I too young? And I said, no, we have so, so much to bring. Um, and it's a career who needs, I mean, some, I, I don't know how to say that in English, but I mean, some uh, to be refreshed as well uh, from young people's energy, uh, ideas and uh, dynamism. So, so yeah, and a last, uh, a last challenge, if, if I still have the time, it's uh, that I would like to identify the lack of understanding that we can face. Um, and again, it's not uh, in my administration because my administration, my ministry is really working hard on that, uh, but it's a general observation uh, because let's say it, uh, diplomacy is not an easy career and it's, it gives challenges and it demands a lot. And it is easy to feel misunderstood. Um, so many people do not understand what we do. Uh, they, they, and they only think that we are going from reception to reception to fancy event, fancy events. And um, they, they just see us as people living in a comfortable way. And uh, a little bit like the, the, the Diplomat series, maybe we'll talk about it later, but yeah, I'm gonna... personally, I think, it's for time management. It's not the yeah. image of our, our job. Um, but this is not the reality. Diplomacy is a Dilan, that can you hear me? Am I on mute? Huh. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop you there, but thank you. Yeah. Uh, just, very... just if I can finish my, my sentence. Definitely. Please. I was just about to finish. So yeah. I was just saying that diplomacy, I mean, it demands uh, sacrifices and sometimes it's not easy to feel uh, understood and supported uh, by our friends, our family. And it's. I think it's also important to to just also talk about our job. What is what is a diplomat? Uh, and especially what is diplomat, diplomacy nowadays? Voila, thank you. Thank you. And then that's good to talk, talk about the intersectionality of things because yeah, we're talking about the gender perspective, but there's also a general overall uh, take of people, especially who aren't in the field uh, about what diplom diplomacy is and isn't. And this just adds to it. And you also touched on ageism as well, because that is ageism, like not taking young people seriously, et cetera. So that, that's just lots of intersectionality there. So I'm going to uh, give the floor to Ambassador Maria, but just right before that, we have some really good questions and it's to all our speakers to think about. And I remember Ambassador Mount uh, talking about sexual harassment uh, in her uh, introduction and so we have a question about like online bull bullying and harassment because we know that uh, women face it a lot more than men than men regardless from the field and so how was your experience about that and how is it being addressed and we have another fellow diplomat from portugal uh, asking if your respective uh, ministry of foreign affairs have placed any quotas of women and i would also love to hear your ideas about placing quotas because uh, like 
Do you think that is the solution? Do you think that will help? Or do you think uh, other uh, things need to be done to address it? So we'll start with uh, Ambassador uh, Maria. Thank you, Susonia. Um, I would just like to address briefly delay. Um, uh, I enjoyed listening to her. And uh, I know that Belgium works very hard um, uh, the Belgian Foreign Ministry works very hard. I have friends, very good friends from the Belgian Foreign Ministry. I just wanted to say the, the people thinking that you're the secretary or, uh, you know, or the spouse of somebody is not going to go away. I'm almost 50 years old and people still think that my husband is the ambassador. And my husband is very, very kind um, to say, no, I'm sorry, my wife is the ambassador. I'm the spouse. And um, it happened to me many, many times, including during Malta National Day. I mean, can you get worse than that? Um, so it's not going to go away, but we can change our attitude towards it in the sense that, you know, the, 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 the problem is not with us. The problem is with other people who misinform themselves, you know, because when you go to a national day, for example, you need to read your invitation and uh, it, you need to read uh, who is the ambassador. You need to prepare and you, you, you cannot assume that the ambassador is wearing pants, um, although we do many times, right? Um, so I just wanted to say that um, as a as a quote unquote footnote um, that it's not going to go away, but our attitude towards it can change um, the narrative definitely. Thank you so much, and that once again underlines. Uh that we need resilience in every area. And I'm sure here, each and every one of you and a lot of uh, our participants as well are showing this resilience, uh, which is translating into change. Not fast enough, but it's definitely there. Okay, so next up, uh, again, about like, like I said, um, online, online or off offline actually, uh, harassment or bullying and what like I think uh, Ambassador Maria did a great intro to that. Said like some things may not change, but what what's important is our attitudes towards that. Uh, so I guess same would go for uh, cases of uh, harassment. And but it will be a dual question, so we don't have to do two rounds. Uh, also about what do you think about um, gender based quotas and other practices. So if anyone wants to take the floor, uh, they can. Okay, Tatiana, I see your hand. Yes, thank you very much. I was trying to find the, the raise your hand uh, function and I couldn't. Thank you so much for, for giving me the floor again. Uh, I just wanted to go back to what Ambassador Maria has said. This uh, thing has happened to all of us being confused uh, as ambassadors, being confused with our spouses, everybody assuming that the, the, the male partner is the ambassador, but they do learn. All our interlocutors learn and in time you, you get established and they, they know exactly who's who. Uh, so this can change and, and, and we can drive that change. Uh, regarding the quotas, um, we do not have such quotas in our ministry. We do not have such quotas in Romania generally, even though there is a debate to introduce them in the, in the political elections for the parliament. Uh, but in, uh, in uh, career based professions, uh, that has not been the case. We do, uh, as I mentioned, have a, quite a balanced uh, makeup in our ministry as far as uh, gender is concerned. Uh, there are many uh, young women uh, joining a, a, a diplomatic career. There's still that allure of, of you know, traveling the world. And then uh, as our uh, uh, a younger colleague, Diali, has said, after you join, you realize that you have other responsibilities in your life that you, you have to take care of. And I think this is where our ministries can help and they can get more women into the service by ensuring uh, career support and uh, support for your personal life, maybe uh, finding ways to, to help our sp spouses uh, joining us uh, in our missions. 
And about quotas, uh, what are your thoughts, Tatiana? Uh, I personally uh, uh, think that quotas are helpful uh, for a limited time and in cert certain circumstances. Because if the trends are going on as they are today, there will be decades until we reach uh, gender parity. Uh, but uh, in my country, they're not uh, uh, an issue of a debate. They don't seem to be popular. People are uh, sort of concerned of the uh, uh, sort of a uh, reversed affirmative action, you help someone, maybe they're not as qualified, but they're promoted only because they are uh, women or, you know, they have other uh, qualifications. So um, they're not uh, uh, popular here. But personally, I do believe they can be useful in certain circumstances and for a limited period of time. Okay, thank you for that. And also that same, uh, I, I, I think that assumption is, again, uh, based on rooted in sexism because it, it the same thing doesn't happen if a male gets that position and so oh, they just got it because of the quota and and obviously with females and ma males there are certain people who aren't qualified for the position that they are in but they're there for other reasons and but this is usually applied to females more i think exactly. unfortunately <laughs> yes and ambassador Maud, um around this discussion what would your contribution be let me unmute okay great um, yes, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not only like when you are with your husband where you are mistaken for somebody else. When you are with your driver, they think the driver is, 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 the, uh, is the diplomat or the ambassador. <laughs> so there are variations. I think there's a general, we, we live in a patriarchal so society, which has been structured in a certain way. So the, people are used to that. And even in meetings where we are sometimes, the male uh, colleagues will make sexist jokes um, because they are used to it as men talking to each other. They forget that you're there. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a cultural change overall for all our societies uh, for gender equality. We've been lucky in South Africa that uh, when during our, our struggle for freedom, uh, women were leading. So we even have uh, August 9th as uh, National Women's Day. And our government has taken that up, even the society, as a, a women's month. Um, so um, the, the issue of making sure that you've got women in government, in the foreign ministry, and everywhere else is something which is taken that it should be done in terms of policy and our commitment. It doesn't always happen like that. Um, as, as one of the colleagues said, women have to work harder um, so that you prove that there's something you know. Um, sometimes in, in the mentoring, those who are above us, who have, because a lot has been done, there they are special envoys and women who are doing wonderful stuff already at high levels in politics. And sometimes they even uh, advise us that you have to wear differently so that you are taken seriously at first. So once they, they know what you know, that you are actually. Uh, a capable diplomat, then uh, you can start wearing a different way. Online bullying, I remember in one meeting where high level leaders from the world, and I think it was the deputy president uh, of US, um, Madame uh, Kamo, uh, who said, if there's one um, fight and, and program she wants to lead is the bullying of women in the social media and online. So I think there is a discussion taking place somewhere which is going to mobilize women leaders to start uh, pushing, uh, not only women leaders, all the leaders to come up with something which can deal with this in our space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Ma. And uh, like you said, I mean, we, of course our emphasis today is women, but yeah, we, we need everyone. We need men uh, in this in this uh, struggle supporting us too. And uh, Juicy, I'd like to go back to you and hear your thoughts. Yeah. So talking about uh, quotas uh, uh, in Italy, we don't have it. But um, and also, I mean, from one end, they are really they are not really popular, right? It could be it could seem uh, unfair from from a certain point of view. But I believe that they can could help. Uh, they could help because it's late. We are we are running late, so we need uh, maybe aggressive <laughs> actions. And probably, probably this can be one of them. 
but more than quotas, I believe that uh, um, the government, the government, every every country should have um, a special special envoy for gender equality, um, an ambassador for gender equality, a supervisor anywhere, because. Um, as a, someone before said, uh, there are many women trained, but they are not used enough. So probably we need uh, an, uh, to oversee this. So every country should find um, should have a, a, an over, overseeing person. Uh, so the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs is very sensitive uh, about the gender equality, and uh, most of the main departments have a person who really focus uh, his activity, her activity, because it can be a man, can be a woman, on uh, overseeing uh, the, the gender equality issues. And we had uh, some uh, um, um, rules, right? Uh, rules that uh, uh, guarantee, ensure that there is uh, uh, at least 50% of uh, female presence in some activities for example uh you know panel discussion we 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 uh, are um we definitely want 50% of rep- female representation in in all the panel discussion in, in the ministry of for in the Italian minister of foreign affairs uh or for example we push to have uh, um the a uh, 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 strong uh, representation of uh, of uh, women in the delegation who follows the, the 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 minister in his uh, um, mission abroad because now this is very strategic so w- there is a lot of visibility in terms of news media social media uh, when a minister goes abroad right and sometimes the delegation is as visibility too so the 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 team the, of the minister has to be uh, at least 50% uh, represented by, by women. So a small step, but can be really, really strategic. Honestly, I feel very lucky because I have an ambassador in, in the, the ambassador of Italy in the United States is a woman. And she was the first female ambassador to the United States, the first Italian uh, female ambassador to the United States. And she's a pioneer. She was a um, uh, also, the first ambassador to the uh, the permanent representative to the United Nations. Uh, so she's 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 a fighter for women, and I'm so lucky to work with her and to work in our embassy. Our embassy, as uh, as the is a champion for gender uh, for gender equality. All our panels, discussion, all our event have um, events have, have the um, a strong female representation, and this is because. It's a top-down decision, and it works. That's why I, I, I talked before about policies. Uh, so it's a really, really important a top-down approach, in my opinion. I'm this time. I'm unmuted. Right? You can hear me. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you for all that valuable input. And also, there's a great uh, discussion. I mean, comments and questions going on in the chat as well. Uh, but I will go to Delay uh, first about to hear her thoughts about uh, quotas or different policies. But I'd also like to say, like uh, Juicy, definitely, I think there has to be uh, some top-down efforts to increase the speed because like uh you all said previously it, at, at this rate it's going to take forever <laughs> to achieve equality and i don't think anyone wants to wait for that so um delay and after uh, after delay uh, i'll slowly start wrapping up and but i'll give the floor to my colleague katja uh, for some input about the Diplo Academy and uh, questions and comments from the floor. But before that, our youngest diplomat, Delay, please, uh, your thoughts. Thank you, Susonia. Um, so about the quotas, uh, in diplomacy, Belgium does, uh, does not have quotas. Um, but it is true that nowadays it is crucial that uh, governments and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, they need constantly, constantly to adapt to changes in order to be uh, as inclusive as possible and ensure that women in this career um, are supported, not only in their work, uh, but also in their personal lives, uh, which are 
which is inevitably uh, affected by this uh, profession. But in Belgium, uh, our ministry has uh, a family officer. So it's, it's uh, someone who's, uh, who's here to, to help every diplomat and to hear every diplomat about their uh, more personal situation, family situation, and also try to find solutions uh, that can fit for their personal situation and their family. Uh, so this is a, a really, really huge support. And this person also is, has also um, its place in, uh, in, in the hierarchy and uh, plays a crucial role uh, in the ministry. And we also have an informal network in the ministry that brings together women from the foreign service uh, with the aim of raising awareness among the hierarchy uh, about gender issues. And so there are, um, there are exchanges who take place uh, regularly. And at the federal level, um, there's also collaboration. Uh, this is the uh, FE link network, and it's an independent network uh, within the administration that focuses on supporting women and developing uh, their networks and to thrive personally and continue to expand uh, their career opportunities. So there's uh, a lot who is uh, done inside because, I mean, quotas, so from my personal point of view, um, I think it might help, but for the short term, uh, it can push a little bit, but uh, on the long term, I don't see it as a, as a sustainable solution because otherwise we'll be in a situation when we will hire women just to have women. And and this is this is this is not sustainable. Um, and and I have already seen that in, in, in many situations, uh, or I've heard that from, from, from colleagues working in, in, in different, uh, different fields. Um, yeah, there are some companies who hire women just because, yeah, she's a woman and they don't even look at their CVs or, or, or skills. And, and this, this is not okay. This is not okay. So um, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, this is uh, my personal opinion on the quotas, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. I think I didn't forget something. No. Okay, and this isn't based on any research, but uh, what you just said, uh, did I like? I think the point while implementing quotas, that should not be the way anyway. It's just a way to discredit uh, quota uh, applications to just take anyone into a position, but just make sure that they're a woman because, but. That is not the way. I mean, it, even if it's a quota for women, we could still make sure that that person has the right experiences and education and the background. Uh, otherwise, I, I'm suspecting, like I said, maybe it's a compost theory, but I'm suspecting it's a way to say, oh, see, it doesn't it doesn't work to, to hire women just because they're women. But that's not supposed to be the point of a quota system anyway. It's supposed to be uh, qualified women or men and there's even more conversation going on in the chat and that, that is great. Please continue to share your experiences there because I think we have quite a few uh, female uh, female in, in diplomacy and foreign policy sharing their experiences there. But now I'll go to Katja. Uh, Katja will talk about, like I said, the, the Diplo Academy's alumni from a gender perspective because Diplo Foundation has been uh, providing uh, providing uh, capacity building programs for the last 20 years uh, to uh, to all countries, but to especially small uh, island states and to developing uh, nations. And well, I won't get too much into it and take from her time. So Katja, could you uh, please share your findings with us and uh, some of the comments and questions from the floor? Thank you very much, Sonia. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this event and a big thank you to our esteemed uh, panelists for their valuable input. This has inspired uh, our online participants to share their own experiences. Uh, before I move to the questions and comments from our online audience, which are, there are quite a few questions, I would like to share some data and insights on women participation in DEPLOS courses uh, for the past five years. Let me try to share my screen and you'll tell me if you can see it. I hope you do. Yes, uh, you do. Just a second, I'll enlarge it. Yeah, voila. Yeah. So uh, 
as you can see, the uh, number of or per participation of uh, women and uh, men in our courses for the past five years is almost equal with minor uh, and almost negligible oscillations uh, in the last couple of years. But the significant participation of women speaks volumes, especially considering uh, that most of our course participants come from uh, developing countries, as Sonia mentioned, and I had a look at the map uh, today uh, at the at the uh, geographic representation of our students, and uh, the vast majority of them are indeed from um, developing states. That said, we could observe a significant gender gap regarding participation in tech-oriented courses as opposed to diplomacy oriented courses. So whereas women are more interested in uh, diplomatic courses such as bilateral diplomacy, e-diplomacy that I'm currently teaching, or even cybersecurity diplomacy, tech oriented courses such as cybersecurity and artificial intelligence have attracted far less, uh, far, far fewer women than men, as you can see on your screen. This has however changed in 2022, uh, as far as cybersecurity course is concerned, and we do hope that uh, the participation of women in these courses will continue to grow uh, in the next few years uh, because um, they are equally important, if not more, in today's in today's digitalized world. Uh, now, let me go back to our questions. Um, I'll stop the screen sharing and uh, read them out. Sorry, Katarina, just yeah. right before the questions, mm -hmm. I realized I forgot to mention something and it goes, uh, I think the timing is right for this, to all our female uh, participants at this event, uh, as Diplo courses, as Diplo Academy, we're offering a 15% discount from any of the July courses that they would consider uh, applying to and learning at. And we could consider this as a... Thank you to women who are in diplomacy and who are considering to be in diplomacy. So uh, we'll, we'll be sharing links later, but just wanted to uh, add that. And yeah, please continue. Definitely. And our next cybersecurity course starts this October. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to have you on board. Um, uh, yeah, when it comes to questions, we have received two questions from our audience on LinkedIn. Uh, the first one is, is there any specific GESI marker for women in diplomacy? Uh, and is there a kind of research about the participation of women in official diplomacy worldwide or at least at certain regional level? Then moving on to our uh, Zoom audience, um, um, Ginger said kudos to Ambassador Lomo. She just was just going to ask about training and educational opportunities. Uh, so thank you for this particular emphasis. But how do we encourage more women to engage? Um, then we have received another two questions on uh, women uh, online ha harassment and quotas, which you already responded to. Um, uh, there on we have re received another question on uh, intersectionality. Um, so our Online audience would like to know how as diplomats or people working in diplomacy can address this also to avoid a certain level of saviorism complex, especially when working in countries where the social construct around the gender are founded in culture, religion and traditions. Uh, also, what can be done to facilitate careers or women diplomats and reinforce a feminist diplomacy that promotes equality between men and women in the world, particularly in low and medium income countries? On, we have received another question on feminist diplomacy. Um, yeah, since 2014, few countries such as Sweden have been defending and carrying a feminist foreign policy, which consists of promoting through diplomatic relations, ideas, and good practices to achieve gender equality. This foreign policy, if not called by the same name everywhere, seems to be embraced by other states and raises the issue of women's participation, uh, representation in international arenas. What progress has been made over the past 25 years? What obstacles remain and how can they be overcome? Uh, another question, particularly related to Romania, uh, was the following. Is it possible in Romania for spouses to work at the same embassy? Uh, and last but not least, if I'm not mistaken, 
Uh, women are still underrepresented in senior diplomatic positions, despite an increasing support by numerous governments for women's representation in negotiations. What does feminist diplomacy stand for in today's complex world of great powers competition? What can uh, be achieved? What steps remain to be taken to fulfill this ambitious agenda and for feminist diplomacy to become mainstream? So the majority of them are uh, centered around feminist diplomacy and foreign policy. Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Sonia. Thank you so much, Katarina, for that uh, wrap up. And there was quite a bit of comments and questions, some of them already answered. But uh, I would like to ask our panelists if there's a particular question that you would like to answer that you would like to take or we'll we'll take a, another round. Yeah, okay, I, I see your hand. Do you see, please go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I was looking for the... <laughs> this, this works too. <laughs> oh. So yeah, um, too many questions, but uh, I, I will pick the one uh, how to to increase awareness, uh, to raise uh, awareness among all the the women. So uh, as I, for, I mean, uh, in the opening, my opening remarks, I said something about communication. I think the key word is communicate, communicate, communicate. So talk, speak up. We need to share. Especially, especially uh, women, uh, I mean, senior, uh, uh, senior professionals, senior diplomats should uh, feel the responsibility to share uh, their experience with the young generation. So communication can be just go to the university, go to the school and talk, talk, talk and talk about your experience with the young uh, student, young women. And, but also work on the official communication, the message that you wanna, you wanna uh, share. So, you know, we have a lot of stereotypes, our advertisement, the social media, uh, maybe not today uh, like it was 10 years ago, but definitely there are still, um, you know, even in the learning, learning materials, we have still male represented. So we should work on this, uh, we, we, in a more professional approach in communication. And um, because this helps, this is a, a, a indirectly, uh, an indirectly approach uh, of mentoring, right? So, uh, you know, how many times uh, we, we talk about the movie uh, Eden Figures, the soft power of mentoring, the soft power of uh, communication. So the Eden Figures talks about, you know, the scientists at the NASA, is very popular. We know it, right? And we know also that the Queen Gambit, you remember Netflix, the TV series, right? So what happened after that? So all the women started playing chess, right? So it works. And now we have another TV series, The Diplomats on Netflix and the ambassador, the American ambassador to, to uh, UK is a woman. So it, I I have the feeling that we are moving forward and we are doing the really uh, big steps. Um, and the last last point is networking. So let me share a little bit my experience in thermal networking. So I met the two amazing women here in, in DC, the, the, con the science counselor for, uh, at the embassy of uh, France and the science counselor at the embassy of Germany. And we talk about this. It was a small group. But we decided to talk about all the difficulties of the issues that we have to cope with. And we decided to fund uh, an association. So last February, on the occasion of the International Day of Women in Science, we found the Women in Science Diplomacy Association. So we were just the three at the beginning, now are 50. It's not, there is no legal frame right now. Probably we will do it in the future. Uh, we don't have a, a, a website yet. We have just a social media page. But, you know, every day we have new members. So it means that probably we need to talk. And it's definitely we are surrounded by a fertile environment. So let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> I love this positive take. And since we're almost wrapping up the event, definitely communication. And I think just the fact that you're all here and our participants are here and just like exchanging uh, experiences is I, within itself. I think it's powerful. And I, I imagine it's also very inspiring as well to, uh, well, not to 
people from all ages, uh, to be honest. And so I'll, I'll be getting some uh, closing statements uh, from everyone. So, uh, but we, it, it would be nice to focus on like, like we were saying, like uh, mentorship op opportunities that you would like to mention or things that uh, you yourself have uh, found that was uh, useful in your uh, career journey. And yeah, and anything else that you may want to add. Uh, so Ambassador Maud, if, if you'd like to go, the floor is yours. Yeah, but you're still muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I really believe that women working together is very, very important. When we talk about diplomacy, we usually talk about the official diplomacy between governments. But there are NGOs and different organizations out there. Uh, for instance, what we've found where there's conflict is that you'll find women community, women in communities who are affected by conflict, um, wanting to engage and, and, and be involved in bringing about peace. And some of the women have said the best way to do it is to bring the wives and the families of the political leaders who are fighting. And so you bring the women from different sectors who are affected in, in different ways to say, how can we work together to, to bring to a stop to this? So working together and having networks is a very, very important part. Also intergenerational equality, if we remember, the Equality Forum, which was uh, started by France and Mexico, um, also is about how do different generations work together to share the experience and then work together going forward. I think that's very, very important. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Digitization, I think we need to change it. Women must be involved in cybersecurity in all this area because that's the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Mount, for contributing to this uh, conversation. And uh, Tatiana, if you are still there, we'll have your uh, closing remarks. And yes. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy that one of the previous speakers has mentioned the, the Netflix series, The Diplomats, because this is sort of glamorizes what we do and maybe attract more women to diplomacy. But I think we ourselves are role models for other women who would like to, to join the Foreign Service. When I joined, there were very few women that I could look up to, but I had fantastic mentors that had set me on, on my way. And I think we, we can return this and we can help new generations of women, uh, you know, uh, choose this career path. And when they do, to, to help them uh, do the career that they, they're aiming for. Uh, I uh, also a previous speaker mentioned the, the, the networking that the science counselors are doing, the heads of mission, uh, the women ambassadors all over the world in all capitals. I'm sure they, they are uh, organized together. They have um, regular meetings and they share their experiences and, and promote a common agenda of, of, of gender equality. Uh, so yes, I think we ourselves can be role models for the for the new generations. And I think you already are uh, role models for the new generation, just because because really being able to look and say, okay, this person uh, like me, a woman, has been doing this successfully for 10, 20, 30 years. That's inspiration within itself. So uh, to all of you, once again, thank you. Thank you for doing what you do. And uh, Ambassador uh, Maria, some closing remarks from you, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I think my takeaway will be um, perseverance and persistence, these two words, um, which have always marked my, my, my way forward. Um, incidentally, my mentors um, in this career were mostly men. Um, but uh, funnily, men who had daughters. Um, uh, so probably they were looking at me as um, uh, what they wished, the environment that they wished for their own children, for their own daughters. Um, uh, I Previously, there was a a discussion about quotas. I don't want to reopen that discussion, but I would just like to say that I had a 180 degree um, uh, shift um, uh, about quotas because in Malta we introduced quotas um, in Parliament. Um, it would have never, we would have never broken that glass ceiling if we didn't. And I do believe, and I'm going to be very, very candid about this, 
that if we can introduce women, whatever their level of knowledge in politics may be, through quotas in parliament, um, that would definitely not be more different, any more different than men who are not so capable of running politics, who are actually voted into parliament. So um, uh, some, some people who are not capable of doing politics are voted into parliament. And some people reach there by quota. But at the same time, we have also very good women who through that quota manage to get there and get mentored. I was never the perfect diplomat, especially in the beginning. But I was mentored and I was turned into um, something that could, someone who can help my country. So uh, we need to keep on um, believing in women, even if they are not um, perfect in the beginning, we can train them and we can educate them. And since we speak of education, I think that is the real key, that we start from a very young age helping girls, girls, not women, women is too late, girls, believing in their voice. And I would like to conclude my intervention with what, um, with my choice of quote for this year um, from Med Madeleine Albright, who had said, it took me quite a long time to develop a voice. And now that I have it, I'm not going to be silent. So I think we all need to listen to ourselves and believe in ourselves. Okay, that quote gave me goosebumps. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, Ambassador Maria. And uh, Delay, if we could also hear your closing remarks and what what type of mentoring, mentoring maybe you uh, benefited from and what you found uh, useful and any other thoughts you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for, I mean, organizing this event and, and thank you to the um, other panelists because it was very inspiring to hear from all of you. Um, so as concluding remarks, I would say, okay, so we have made progress. But there's still more to be done. I think we all agree on that. Um, there are laws and policies on the national and international uh, level, but this progress comes also from... Uh, actions on the daily basis. So it means an inclusive communication from governments, from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, from diplomats. Um, in, in Belgium, for example, uh, we have a training about digital diplomacy and we are, we are really encouraged to uh, be active on Twitter and uh, yes, to, to, to use digital diplomacy as a tool. Um, but it's also networking, uh, mentoring programs uh, and, and role model. and. Before joining uh, the the Belgian Foreign Service, I, I, I did several internships um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I was very lucky to have uh, to have role models who, who I still consider now as as mentor, uh, but also here at the embassy, our deputy head of mission, she's uh, she's incredible. She's a real mentor, and we also have women ambassadors, um, also very inspiring in in our foreign service. And from what I have uh, observed uh, of this women diplomat, um, is that they're just they're not afraid to assert them, themselves and speak up. Uh, they do not apologize for who they are uh, because actually there's no reason to apologize for being a woman in a career that aims to represent their country and its population and so including women. Um, so unfortunately we have uh, grown up in a society where women uh, are thought to be perfect and not to do too much, uh, to remain calm, polite and kind, etc. But um, all of this pushes women to belittle themselves and underestimate their incredible potential. Uh, so this is why I think the importance of a role model, we haven't talked about it, uh, is, is crucial. Um, and last but not least, I would say just I mean, if you want to have a career in diplomacy, if you want to join the uh, foreign service of a country, just go for it and and work hard for it, despite what people uh, can say and all the remarks about your family life and finding a man um, or a woman who will uh, who will follow you. Because um, I, I've heard so much of it, and there were so many people who tried to 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 change my mind actually. 
and I just decided to follow my dreams and and because I'm passionate about this career and honestly I'm glad that I didn't listen to anybody because now I passed the budget diplomatic exam I, I am at my first posting and I am really happy in what I do and when you're happy and passionate about what you do I mean the rest will come and you do not have to worry about your I don't know your personal life and, and whatever I mean it's it's all going to make sense and just believe in yourself believe in your dreams and um and voila thank you so much for those inspiring closing remarks uh Dilai. and i'm sure uh, many new generations of women diplomats will continue to come and we will get there we're not there yet but we will get there and happy women in diplomacy day to all our panelists and participants and thank you for being here today. Thank you for sharing your experiences and hope to e see you or see you in person sometime somewhere. And as a one final remark, I would like to remind the uh, for the event participants the 15% discount on our diplomacy courses. You can visit our website. And thank you once again and have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.